All right, everyone that is staying, if I can have you be seated so that we can make sure to um, every, every, give an opportunity for everyone who wants to um, bring comments and questions up to the larger group. Um, the first thing I want to say, because there have been a number of questions, is what's going to happen to these questions? They will be um, input into the computer and then OHP will respond to them and that will go on to their website. It won't happen by tomorrow, but it will happen um, as quickly as possible. And some of the questions that are up here are very easily answerable by the staff right now. So we thought, with your permission, we'll take an opportunity to do that. And that will also go up on the website. And then we will go to the public comments. Yes, sir. Could they make a mark on the ones they answered? Sure. You know, a little green mark or something like that so, so we know which ones were open and which ones were not open. Absolutely. No problem with that. So we're trying to remember, you know, we took a note while you were speaking, and there were a few that we definitely want to answer tonight. Um, and so we're trying to find where they ended up. Hold the microphone closer. Sorry about that. Um, so if I live in a bungalow and my neighbor tears down his bungalow and builds a multi-story mansion, what systems are currently in place to protect me from my neighbor? Um, with the store designation, there are citywide store design guidelines that would be in place as part of the design review process. There is a specific chapter in those guidelines for new construction, excuse me. Um, and in those guidelines, it does address things like scale and massing, and a lot of the, the bigger things that that um, would restrict um, non-conforming uh, development within a, a, a more residential neighborhood. And so if you do have single family or single story residences on a the street, there are design controls that would limit um, the height and scale of of new um, houses being constructed. Um, second question. Is it necessary to go to the office for a COA, which is a certificate of appropriateness? Um, and then if 99% is approved, why not use email or a streamlined process? And that's a very easy answer. We do use email. Um, the forms are downloadable on our website. Um, you can, it's a PDF format. You can fill it in. You can email it to ohp at sanantonio.gov and a planner will follow up within 24 hours um, if they can. If they have more questions, they'll contact you and let you know. But email is an option as well as people mail in their applications physically um, outside of actually coming down to the office. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Am I speaking too close to the mic? Okay, great. Right. Um, I think Corey just answered a question about um, staff and, and how you can get a hold of us and how accessible we are. I just wanted to point out there was another question. Easy accessibility to city staff should be addressed, a specific neighborhood representative. And actually, we have something set up like that. Um, I'm not sure if you are familiar with all of our faces and our names, but we had a staff member leave us in June. And so um, prior to her departure, Corey and Sarah took all of our historic districts and divided them up. And they were the, the kind of neighborhood liaisons. Kind of, I joked around saying, you know, you guys are kind of the ear on the street, and, and you know what people are concerned about, and you know what uh, their questions are, and, and you're the same person that they can talk, contact whenever they have a question. So we're, we're going to continue that format. Um, uh, we'll be fully staffed pretty soon. And uh, so you will have someone that your neighborhood can contact anytime. It's someone who will make an effort to distribute any kind of new information to you. So the answer is, yeah, we do have neighborhood representatives. And I want to go ahead and answer another question real quick that uh, was, can I change my duplex to a single family home in historic? Um, earlier we were talking about historic designation and how that is uh, part of the zoning process and it's an overlay zoning and what that means is your base zoning is what determines the use of your property and Kat's still in the room in case we have any technical questions tell me if I get it wrong Kat but your base zoning is what determines the use of the property 
single family residence, duplex, multifamily, commercial, industrial, and so on. Overlay does not affect that at all. So if your base zoning allows for you to convert your duplex into single family, then by all means, go right ahead. Um, the only thing that we would um, want to know about is if you're going to make changes to the outside, and we just want to make sure you get the approvals before you move forward. Yes, sir. That was my question. Yes, sir. Uh, specifically, I have two doors in the front. I won't design your project for you or answer all of those specific questions, and I do want to say that the majority of the applicants that come to us, they have a vision for their home. They have something in mind. And what our job is, is to help them achieve that vision through the ordinance and through the guidelines. And so to answer that question, I mean, we, would, we would ask you, well, what do you want to do exactly? Bring in a drawing and let's talk about it. And then we'll find a way to get that design solution to fit the guidelines so you can get approval and move on. Um, our, we always look for yes. We always look for a yes, and so do the commissioners. I think this may be a duplicate, but let me read it out loud just to make sure that I'm covering it. Um, property use versus appearance, um, i.e. coffee house. Um, basically, that's what I was just talking about, our base zoning and overlay. So it's the base zoning that would determine its use as a restaurant or a coffee shop, and the historic designation would not affect their uh, ability to use it for that. As long as the base zoning, as long as they can comply with the use that's associated to the base zoning, the story won't change that. My next question, how much time does it take to have my project approved by OHP? Um, as I mentioned earlier, for administrative approvals, technically we have, not technically, but we usually have a, a policy of returning those within 24 hours if received. Um, obviously, if you come down to the counter and speak to a planner in person, you will most likely leave with that approval unless there's some outstanding materials we need. The HDRC process, which is the process in place for larger projects, new construction, additions, things that require plan review in most cases, um, that takes a little bit longer. Um, there's a timeline in place. The HDRC meets two weeks, um, the first and third Wednesday um, in the month. Um, so usually it's a three to four week process depending on when you get your application in. So those do take a little bit longer. Um, but Again, the administrative approvals, just the repair and maintenance and smaller items. You don't have to worry about um, a weekend project being put on hold for that reason. Um, question, can you hear me? Am I on still? Okay, great. Um, one of the uh, concerns, if the dilapidated, unrepairable, not able to be demolished under historic. Um, to answer that question, we, we talk about historic designation helping neighborhoods with demolitions that are happening. Um, what that means is that there's just going to be simply a process someone would have to go through if they want to demolish a home. Um, there are, um, there's language in the code that talks about loss of significance, uh, if there's severe deterioration. Um, there, there are, there, there's a way, there's a method that if a home truly is beyond repair, if it really, it just needs to go, there is a process in place to allow that to happen. The way I like to look at demolition review is, is that in historic districts, it just causes you to pause for a moment, think about alternatives. We always say that in historic designations, demolition is the last, last action of last resort. So, so really the process will just allow you to take a moment to see if there's anything that can be salvaged or if there's something that can be done to, you, to, to maintain the house. If there's not, then demolition would be approved and you'd be able to move forward. I do want to mention that in historic districts, and this is part of the protection, uh, part of the, the, the total to preserve the character, is before demolition is allowed to happen, before you get that demolition permit, you'll have to um, get your replacement plans approved. So if you live next door to a house that's been approved to be demolished, it won't be torn down until the owner is ready to build. So you won't be sitting there staring at a, an empty lot with the grass overgrowing. It'll be replaced with something else that's been approved. Yes, sir. I'm assuming if you had like wire and it's your home always considered destroyed, that would be you know, not considered. Definitely, yeah. That's yeah. Not out of that course. And, and, and in case someone asks the question, we get asked this often if it were taken down by fire, we would not come and say, okay, there's a photograph, we expect you to do the exact <laughs> same. It would, that, no, we wouldn't do that. We had a few questions about guidelines in general. One was related to sustainability and such such as solar panels, rainwater harvesting, 
a lot of questions were about the guidelines for landscaping, and so I'll just address both of those in one swoop. Um, yes, solar panels, rainwater harvesting. Um, we never had an application for, for wind or anything like that, but um, there are guidelines in place and the adopted historic design guidelines for those. Um, in most cases where so solar panels are located on the, on the rear of the property, those are approved administratively. Um, in some cases, they do go to the HCRC when they're located on the front of the house. Um, there are certain guidelines that they look for, such as you know whether the, the panels are installed flush with the roof versus up on stilts or things like that. Um, but those are very often approved. Um, same with same with rainwater harvesting. Um, there are obviously preferred locations on the house where where the guidelines would recommend those be placed, um, but it's certainly allowed, and we do see it a lot in our historic districts. Um, landscaping. There are guidelines. There's an entire chapter for what's called side elements that includes landscaping, things like driveways, walkways, sidewalks, um, pavers. Um, we are not picky about plants. Obviously, you know, San Antonio is evolving. Um, we see more xeriscaping than we have seen before. Um, obviously, historic plant palettes and what people have had access to over time has changed. Um, so we're not going to tell you whether you can or cannot plant the pansies that we heard. Um, <laughs> But what we're more interested in are those bigger items, such as replacing lawn with you know, lava rocks or gravel mulch, um, uh, expanding upon driveways, um, introducing new curb cuts to the properties, those, those other items that are more permanent that do have an impact to the property. And so that's what the guidelines really address. Um, and now in most instances, if you're just doing maintenance, you know, maintaining your lawn, replanting flower beds, mowing the lawn, that does not require a certificate. In most cases, yes. Um, we just want to make sure that it's not too close to the house or things that might cause permanent damage, especially depending on the species and its, its mature size. Um, so that's why we do ask that those come in. This so then essentially, your concern about the oak tree being planted would be damage to the foundation of the house. Exactly. Which obviously is a benefit to the person who wishes to plant the oak tree, correct? If they don't want to have a damaged foundation. Right. I mean, no. <laughs> no. Yeah, shrubs and that sort of thing. Um, in most cases, it's administrative approval because a lot of people do bring those to us. Um, but Can you speak up? sorry, in most cases, planting shrubs and minor things like that is administrative approval. Most people know to bring those to us. But in cases where you know somebody does work like that over a weekend, it's not something that we usually enforce unless there's a clear negative impact, which sometimes there is depending on the situation. And, and I'll get to your question in just a minute, Michael. I just wanted to say one more thing about that. I think that the primary um, the primary change that the guidelines are trying to address is that impervious surface. Because uh, I think that's that's the concern that some of the districts have. If you you know if they decide to put concrete all in the front yard and they don't have grass anymore and it's just all paving. Uh, that that's really what the landscape guidelines were designed to address. I'm sorry Michael, go ahead. I'd actually like to go back and question the demolitions. Um, I don't know. We sat on the PSP board together and approved demolitions across the city. I don't remember if you could work more together when it happened, but there's several times when there was properties that were nuisances in the neighborhood that were before us for demolition, and Shannon would show up and say, don't demolish this property. It may be a nuisance, but we want to find a way to save it. Even if the owner doesn't want to save it, we want it saved, so don't demolish it. I've been to the HDRC meeting, and I saw a guy had a house that repaired might be worth $100,000. He came with estimates from contractors for $130,000 to repair the home and was told by HCRC that he did not have a financial burden preventing him from repairing the house and they demanded to repair it rather than knock it down. I also understand that if a home is demolished anyway, despite not having permission, there's a five year wait before something else can be built on that lot. Are those, can you speak to any of more of that? Yes. I'm sorry, that was a lot of information specific question. So, um, uh, two, two questions really. You made the point that there's a process for going through for demolition, and if things need to be demolished, they should be. Right. Yet, I firsthand have seen that not put into effect. I've seen things come up to stop that. And so, I'm curious more about that process, and if you have any details on how often it is approved versus denied, uh, that's kind of part one of the question. Part two of the question is if somebody knocks down the historic historic structure without permission, isn't it, isn't there a five, only a five year delay before they can build whatever they get permission to build? So 
The second question, yes. And there's some other provisions that the UDC has that address that, but yes. Um, and then going back to BSB, that, that's a different, that is a, a separate process. The Building Standards Board is a, um, a quasi-judicial board that reviews dangerous premises and uh, property maintenance cases. Um, and that is a separate process from the story. But we do get the opportunity to review all demolitions within the city limits of San Antonio, and so we have the opportunity to comment on those. And those are very difficult cases, Michael, you know. Those are very difficult. They have extenuating circumstances. Um, but we, we try to be a resource to the board to let them know that if it's an important resource uh, or if it's something that they should pause a moment and maybe there's some program we have that they might qualify for, um, we, we ask them to, to, take, to give us that opportunity to, to try and make that happen. I know, sir, you have a question, but I think we had a question over here. Yes. No. The question was about the planning of the oak tree. If that's something that could be handled maybe via email or, you know, is it going to be onerous? No, it, and the answer was yes. It's, it's a very uh, simple, it's a simple re uh, request that we can respond to almost immediately. Um, sir, I think you had a question. I, I, just, I just recall referencing demolition. I believe, did the city demolish some homes in Tobin Hill a couple of years ago? I, I don't know which one specifically. I mean, it, it, it is possible the yeah. Building Standards Board saying, does order saying, demolition. These things are allowed and sometimes the city does. Okay? Okay. We had, um, I wanted to answer the question regarding a comparison between NCD and historic. Um, the specific wording was, is, what is the difference interplay between conservation district and historic designation. Um, I have people ask me all the time, which is better? And I think that there are two different uh, designations, there are two different processes, design review processes. Um, NCDs, this is the best way I can explain it. An NCD, a neighborhood decides architectural fe features that are important to the character of the neighborhood. So the NCD um, that ordinance will outline very specifically those standards, and I use the word standards. They outline those standards. So when you come into the NCD neighborhood, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you come into the neighborhood, you want to do some work, you turn in your permit application with your request, the plan reviewer will make sure that you meet those standards, black and white. You either meet them or you don't. If you meet them, you get a stamp of approval, you get your permit, and you can continue. If you don't, well, then there's a variance process that you would have to go through. Historic designation, we have guidelines. And so if you want to make changes in your historic, on your home, you come to our office, you submit that application, very similar to the permit process. And I mentioned earlier, if you're making major changes, you're going to have to get a permit anyway. So you would come in and you would explain the scope of work, turn in the application. And then based on the guidelines, we'll give you some feedback and we'll, we'll get you acquainted with those. So as you're making your plans, you, you know what those kind of expectations are, those guidelines. And so based on the guidelines, we'll uh, go through the commission and then they will take action based on the guidelines. There are some applications that are approved that don't, that don't follow the guideline completely. But I think that's the benefit of historic review is because you can make an argument. You can make a case for that specific change you want to make that may not be in keeping with the guidelines, but you get that opportunity. In an NCD, you don't really get that opportunity. You are either said yes or no. If you want to do something outside of those standards, then you would have to go to another board to request a variance to the code. Um, so our process, you know, we get to kind of work with you for that design solution with our staff and with the commission, and you don't have to go to another board to get that ultimate approval. Does that kind of answer the question? Okay, there's more. I guess not. Um, yes, ma'am. So the NCD is administered by a different group? Yes, ma'am. The question was, who administers NCDs? The Neighborhood Conservation District Program is administered by Planning? Development Services. CAT is administered by the Development Services Department. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. 
like to do if you don't mind if you want to give me some contact information Kat looks like she wants to say a couple of words also I, I don't want to speak exactly for them I know a little bit about the process like I described but the enforcement of that I'm sure code enforcement is, is participating in that but and let's see if Kat has a little time don't walk away from me. all right um, so yes the NCD guidelines are the NCD standards were recently transferred from the planning and community development which helped to create the NCD guidelines and standards uh, with the neighborhoods to us this fiscal year. Uh, there was some staff as well that does the plan review. So again, we're not going to hear about these um, changes or alterations to homes or commercial structures that have the NCD standards uh, unless they come in for a permit. A lot of times they aren't aware that, oh, to replace windows, they need a permit, so they do it over the weekend. So uh, when, code, when a neighbor calls code enforcement, code enforcement comes to us and says, Hey, this is what happened. So we go out and do a review, and we have the act the property owner come in and turn, uh, submit a permit. And from that permit, we do our review. Um, so we utilize those standards that are that are illustrated in the documents that were developed through that process of creating the NCD. Um, a lot of it, a lot of those standards are kind of subjective uh, because they do some aerial views when you're looking at setbacks or things like that. So we are working to help. Um, sort of define those standards in, in, in a way that puts the onus onto the property owner to provide that you know, this is my setback, this is how I measured my median setback or my mean setback, um, and uh, put that onto them so that way they provide us that information and we hold that to them. Uh, because again, we don't have the, the staff, and neither did the Planning and Community Development Department, they didn't have the staff to go out and do the measurements on the ground. Uh, so again, we're just kind of refining that permit process and doing the best that we can uh, to try to get the word out, with, whether it's through the neighborhood associations, to uh, utilize them to pass out maybe some brochures that says, hey, you are in an NCD district, and these are the things that we look at when you want to do some remodeling or some uh, renovations to your home. Um, and hopefully that gets the word out to people so that way they come to us first with a permit before actually doing the work and then having to go through this process of either requesting a variance to the Board of Adjustment to allow the work to continue or having to change out the whole was uh, first I think that one of the questions that was on the board is if you were an NCD and then you become historic now are you subject to both and the answer is no um, that zoning change would, would if you decided to become historic then that would take the place of the NCD um, and I, I, I don't I don't think there's a big change in the process I mean people people know a lot of things you need to pull permits for so if you keep going down you know if you're gonna make significant changes you'd be getting a permit anyway so, yes, it's a hard fact that permits are required for a lot of work. The neighborhoods are assigned for the historic districts. The neighborhood streets are assigned for the historic districts, so you know if you're at historic districts. Oh, 
Is, I'm sorry, I guess I misunderstood the question. Other, uh, part of the answer, yeah. okay. with the conservation district, there's nothing in place that would know I misunderstood. The question was about how do you know, how does an owner know they're in an NCD or how do they know if they're in the historic district? And, and it's true, many historic districts have the brown signs. But I would like for everyone to know that the best way to find out what your zoning is and if you are having to meet any kind of special requirements is to either go to the one stop and ask for the zoning of your property or visit the development services website. There's a interactive map where you can enter an address and it'll tell you what your zoning is. And so I think that uh, anyone, especially purchasing property, I know I would want to know what my zoning is. Not just to know what I have to do, but to also know if a big farm could be open next door or not. Um, yes, I think that a lot of the problems between the Creekside Inn and the Creekside Park are because of the fact that the The NCD question? Uh, the, difference between the difference between NCD. Okay. Uh, um, what was said is that uh, a lot of the consideration on either side, whether to be historic, hinges on that answer, hinges on that question of the difference between NCD and historic. It was a comment being made. Um, it seems like we've started the public comments and questions without actually acknowledging that. Um, <laughs> So that, that's great for participation. Um, I would like to ask the permission of the participants if you would like us to still try to continue to answer the questions that are up there or if we should open it up for public commentary at this point. Can I have a show of hands of who wants the answers to the questions? Okay, great. Thank you. Everybody, I'm still on. Okay. This one, uh, there's a few questions on one, so I'll start with the first question. Who sets the boundaries? I assume the question is, if someone is, if the community is interested in becoming a historic district, who sets the boundaries? Um, usually it's the community who gets together and decides what that boundary is. We provide background information that might help them in, in guiding them and selecting those boundaries. For example, historical boundaries for flats. Um, just, we have a lot of survey information on the different styles of the houses, so we, we can provide them that information so that the community kind of knows where an accumulation or a cluster of a certain style is. And ultimately, it, it kind of depends what it is they're wanting to preserve in their neighborhood. So that's, we, we can provide that background information and work with the community to set those boundaries. If, Jim? I just want to add to that to be clear that um, we that ultimately we respond to what is submitted. So when an application for a historic district is submitted, it includes a proposed boundary. And the determination that the Office of Historic Preservation makes is, is this proposed boundary eligible to become a historic district? So the proposed boundary is set by the people who, the applicants, whoever submits the initial request, it is not set by the Office of Historic Preservation. I have a question about that. Yes, ma'am. The, the, the question the question was um, on the street where she lives there's a few homes on the block but it appeared to you that the boundaries are omitting the other ones and keeping the one unfortunately it's really we really can't answer that question because again we did not establish the proposed boundaries and is that the final proposed boundary uh, or is it the extended three or something? there there's no final until city council makes the determinations city council could reduce the boundary if it ever makes it to city council city council could reduce the boundaries they could change the you know, they could amend the boundaries and make the district smaller or different um, they would not ex they could not extend it because there wouldn't have been proper public notice but the determination of what what within the initial request was not made by the office of historic preservation so i would hate to speculate um, and, and answer that question Another question on the same card. If the packet was not from the city, why was it allowed? 
Um, I believe the question is if there's an application for historic designation that is not from the city, why isn't allowed? Oh, I'm sorry. That packet. Um, well, I mean, it's a community meeting and we're here to share information with each other. And so if someone wants to share information with their neighbors, we can do that. 30%, um, how does that process work and what is the whole process? Um, an application for a SORC designation is submitted by someone from the community to our office. And according to the UDC in that process, once an application is submitted, then the office would verify that there is 30% of the property owners in support of that application. I think that answers the question shortly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They're, they're, they're not boats. If, if you own, the question was, if I own six properties within the proposed boundaries, do I get to show support six times? And the answer is yes, you can show, show support six times. It's, it's the um, percentage of properties, not property owners. So it's the percentage of properties. How is, UD, how is UDC and Rio different from the historic district? UDC is an acronym that stands for the Unified Development Code. Um, that, are, that, are, that is the city codes that govern development in the city of San Antonio. So that is everything within the city limits. And that, that, is, that includes zoning and that includes uh, building standards and processes and, and, and things of that nature. RIO is an acronym for River Improvement Overlay. There's that word, overlay. Um, kind of like the historic overlay, there is a river improvement overlay designation out there that was designed for properties that abut the San Antonio River. And does not apply to single, Rio does not apply to single family residents. Is there a middle ground between historic designation and neighborhood conservation district? Those are the only two processes or overlays that we know of that help with um, preserving character of neighborhoods. I don't know if there's a middle ground. It's not in the UDC. So yes, sir. you have to follow the UDC or could you maybe request it of your council man or woman to maybe modify part of the city code? When you say you, you mean resident of San Antonio or right. employee of the city? A resident of San Antonio. Okay. Um, well, if there is something written in the Unified Development Code, that is something that has already been adopted by the council as a whole. There are provisions to do things outside of the UDC, which is what we mentioned earlier, the variance process. So there are cases where someone is able to do something that is outside of what the code allows. So in theory, I mean, I'm, I'm not making this an opinion thing, but in theory, is it possible to create a different set of guidelines due to the precedent that's been set by other options outside of UDC codes, such as variants and things like that? Because the UDC code is pretty onerous to work through. Um, so is it possible that uh, the neighbor can come up with something that might be a one size fits almost all? That, that's a tough question because, well, when we talk about guidelines, um, we have our historic district guidelines. So uh, this is one side of that coin. We do have guidelines that are established for all of the districts in San Antonio. If a neighborhood who has become historic wants to have district-specific guidelines, those can be created and can be adopted and, and added to the guidelines. Um, outside of answering the question about guidelines outside of the unified development code or codes? I, I, I work in code, I can't think no. outside of codes. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Yes. Yeah, they're located on our website. Yes, sir. It, it's a, it's a, it's a large document. It's on our website. We've broken it down by chapters. So if there's something specific, specifically you're looking for, you can go straight to that section. 
And it's also a good resource in general to just to learn about historic districts in town. The back of the section talks about each of the individual districts and what kind of makes them unique, um, as well as shows the, um, the, the map for each one of those districts. And that's one of the things that we'll share and want to show so that everyone can get acquainted with that at our next meeting. We've said this once before, but I just want to reiterate as we as we're kind of approaching the end of the meeting that we are committed to providing a response in writing to every question, including the ones that we've addressed tonight, but especially the ones that we don't have time to get to tonight. And um, we also are committed to um, responding to additional questions at the at the future meetings. So this is not by any means your your last opportunity. It's really just the, the beginning of the conversation. I did ask your permission to go ahead and answer some of the questions and we still, I did also ask permission of the principal of Lamar, who um, I want to thank for um, allowing us to be here this evening. Um, it's been very gracious. So uh, I did ask permission for us to stay a little bit longer. If there are any questions or concerns or comments that have, you have not had an opportunity to make this evening, I think we have a much truncated time, but I think this was a very good session to specifically answer the questions that you all had tonight. Are there others? Um, this is the comment section. I'm concerned about it. It has to do with vinyl siding. A lot of property that I own, if it gets damaged in a storm or by tree falling, would I be allowed to repair that vinyl siding or would I be told I have to The question is, can can I repair my vinyl siding or would I have to remove it? You can repair it. And also, uh, when we put vinyl siding on, we put it on the house, but not on the garage. Would I be able to add vinyl siding to the garage building that doesn't currently have it? It's a separate building from the house. The guidelines usually recommend that uh, those the materials, the existing materials, are the ones that you continue to use. So if you have wood siding on your garage, then the guidelines would steer you towards keeping the wood siding. But if you wanted to switch it out, you can make that request. You can you can certainly ask and another question is if I wanted to add vinyl windows to my vinyl siding on my house, could I do that? Do you have the question is can I add vinyl windows to go with my vinyl siding? Um, again, we would ask a couple of questions. You know, what uh, what is the material of the windows you have now? Are they deteriorated? Are they beyond repair? And they need to be replaced? Do you want to replace them around the whole house? Or maybe you're just interested in doing it in the back? So, you know, we can work with you um, and we can explain what the guidelines say and, and, and we can work through your request. Other public, other comments that we didn't discuss tonight? There's generally more flexibility for the rear of the property. Um, the guidelines actually do address in terms of um, things like additions um, and exterior alterations, preserving the front screen facing side of the house. That doesn't mean the back of the house is outside of the review of the historic design guidelines. Lines are still reviewed, those projects are still reviewed, uh, but there is a leniency and um, the, the HCRC, if they review a project, they may consider um, being more lenient in cases that are not visible from the street and have in the past. There, there was uh, something that came up that you didn't answer the first sentence. Uh, Right. We, we don't, we're not the question about the color. Uh, the question was about, um, is, are you required to um, paint your house a certain color or if there's stringent controls about the color of paint? The answer is no. Um, we do have you come and apply for an administrative certificate of appropriateness for exterior paint. And the reason we do that is, um, A, so we have a record of the work being done, um, and B, so we can make sure that nothing is being painted that shouldn't be painted, such as masonry, uh, brick or stone. Um, a, it's a maintenance issue, and B, uh, that covers up the original uh, materials and colors of the room and stone. Uh, so that's why we have those come in, not because of you know our personal taste regarding color. Yes, sir. Just for the benefit of the 
proud could you announce that Judy C. Code for creating historic district is 35 605. So if anybody wants to do the research, they can do that. UDC section 35605 is the part of the Unified Development Code that describes the process for historic designation. Um, you can access that information a couple of different ways. I use Municode, M-U-N-I-C-O-D-E, and that allows you to view codes for pretty much every city in the United States, including San Antonio. So we use that a lot. Um, we have the physical code book in our office. We'd be happy to make copies for you or print copies for you. Or we can email sections to you as well. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Did you just say you can't paint masonry? Some, some. If it's if it's not previously painted, uh, if it's exposed stone, um, the guidelines recommend against that um, for a couple of reasons: a, because it conceals the original materials, but b, it's a maintenance issue because it causes the stone to retain moisture, and that can actually damage the mortar. And just just a preface that we're talking about historic masonry so there's a there's construction methods that have changed over the years and materials have changed over the years so sometimes the treatment for those are different and, and that's where this guideline comes from okay so like the base around the house below going house yes stuck of skirting yeah that's that's me Where, when is the next meeting on the topic? The next meeting is October the 4th, and the topic is what does historic designation mean to you? And uh, it's part two in its design review. And that next meeting will, will be the Mexican American Unity Council on Commerce, on West Commerce. Um, yes, West Commerce. Uh, and it's a Saturday morning, I believe. So it's at 9 a.m. on Saturday. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, I noticed that someone asked about a video for uh, the minutes, and I was wondering if you take all the questions and put the answers in it, and this is why you know, you know, you maybe send it to our Yes, we are going to, we're going to put all the questions together, they'll be recorded and put into a document. The staff will answer the questions, the questions will be put on the website, also, um, tonight is being recorded by Nowcast, and it will be available online. Um, before everyone leaves this evening, though, I think I would like to um, ask you, there is a comment survey um, document on the table. If you would please fill that out to help evaluate the value of the meeting. We need to know how we can improve this so we can improve communication and really listen to you. Um, so that would be very helpful, and if you have any specifics uh, in terms of recommendations for improving the meeting, then we're happy to listen to those. Did this meeting help uh, to clarify some things? Did, did, it, did it work for you? Great. Thank you very much for taking your precious time this evening to come and improve communication and helpfully improve our neighborhoods. Thank you very much, everybody. Just a reminder, the next two meetings, that information, those dates, and locations are on our website, www.sanantonio.gov backslash historic. And we will be mailing out postcards as well. And please use our uh, website as a resource or call our office. Thank you very much.